Amen. Well, welcome. Um, sadly, I'm not going to draw on Sean the sheep and stuff to keep the youthful edge coming through. Um, I'm going to try and be really serious. Now, this is uh, the Growing and Going in Courage series. And today we're going to look at following Jesus's voice. So our reading that Mads read for us is taken from John 10, verse 22 to 30. And um, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read uh, passages, especially from John, um, I can be drawn in by all like the beautiful imagery. So like, why is John mentioning that it's winter? Why is John telling us when it's, whether it's day or nighttime? Why is John giving us all these bits of information? And I realised that it's almost a coping mechanism to avoid looking at the words Jesus is saying. What if we were to actually look at this passage as you would in a red letter Bible where we look at the words that Jesus says? So he's being accused of not telling them whether or not he was the Messiah, not telling the religious people. They're like, are you the Messiah? You've kept us going for so long. And Jesus is doing all of John calls them signs. Jesus is healing people, bringing wholeness of life to people, which point to Jesus being God incarnate, God in human flesh. And maybe just like the way I sometimes drift off, focusing on little details, they don't seem to click that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus answered, verse 25, I've already told you, but you would not believe me. The deeds I do by my Father's authority speak on my behalf. And I just wonder, can we sometimes be, uh, well, maybe it's just me. I'm not going to reflect this on you lot. Sometimes I move the goalposts. Sometimes I'll ask God to do something. If God just does this or God does that, then I know God is in tune with me. I'm in tune with God and I will do whatever God calls me to do. But the problem is I move the goalposts. It doesn't always line up with what I want. I remember reading a book ages ago. Um, it's basically apologetics for teenagers, which I didn't know existed until I went to uni. And it said this. It said there's a person who's speaking to God and says, if you just turn the whole sea bright pink, you turn the whole sea bright pink, then everyone will believe that you exist. Surely that's the answer. And God's response was, I don't want to waste somebody's whole life trying to explain how it really happened. The fact is, no matter what God does, there will always be a way to explain it. And I'll say honestly, forget about it. I forget about amazing things I've seen God do. John cleverly refers to the actions, the deeds, the signs of Jesus the Messiah as almost a witness, a person, a spoken witness. Because God speaks to us through what we see God doing. I'm going to be looking at a slightly different angle tonight. And I realise that um, I sometimes just put little bullet points in my sermons to go back and said, Oh, remember that healing at Soul Survivor? And suddenly my brain was like, what are you talking about? One healing? It was more than one healing. I remember going up to a guy because I was all excited and people are praying for each other and they're putting hands on them. And I was praying for this person. Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, in your name, heal this person. And they were saying, oh, that's great. Thank you. And then I went over to somebody, not just me, there's loads of us. I went over to this other guy and I just put my hand on his back because people were praying with him already. And I missed all the spiel at the beginning about what are you praying for? How can I pray? All this. So I just put my hand on his back. And I just thought, I thought, Lord Jesus, you heal. And I felt something move under my hand. It was so disgusting. It was like, have you ever seen the mummy? And there's those scarab beetles that like crawl into your brain. I like to do very popular references. Sorry if you haven't seen that. And he put his hand on my hand on his back. And he went, oh, that was it. And I was like, what are you talking about? We are all so excited, so amazed. And there was this other lady who came with our church who had three boys. And um, they were a bit like, um, am I too cool for Soul Survivor? I'm not sure. And uh, basically, she'd had an accident years ago where she went parachuting. I mean, I think it's inevitable. But she went parachuting. 
And um, and it was before, apparently, you were told how to land. So apparently there's a way you're supposed to do it. I don't remember, whatever. The fact is, she didn't do it properly, and she knackered her back. Can I say knackered? Said it. Hurt her back really badly. Oh, it's on YouTube. Ah, it's fine. People know I swear. It's fine. Um, Unless you're under 18. Um, And basically, she landed square on her feet, and it kind of like shot something up her back, and it was horrendous. And... um, and Mike Pilavachi, who leads us out, said, right, let's pray for people. Let's pray for people. And, and she went forward. And of course, like, the boy's like, oh, mum, please don't. Don't go forward. And she was lying on her back. And they were praying for her. And she literally just went, top of her voice, oh, my God. And it was such a sincere prayer. Because she said the pain stopped. This discomfort had stopped. And she still talks about it now. So it's not even one of those, in the moment, did it happen? It's a bit better than it was before, which are all still God working. But it is just that having the boldness, the bravery. Now, Jesus goes on to say, and this, I think this is the killer, verse 26, he says, But you will not believe, for you are not my sheep. You will not believe, for you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And again, I know I've drifted into this place where I stopped listening. I think I've kind of done enough. I don't know about you, but um, I don't know loads about farming. I don't know loads about being a shepherd. I don't know loads about sheep. I don't really understand anything. Kate does. You had like a weird lambing sesh. Not you personally, but the sheep there. And I don't know, do we have any shepherds in the room? Just the one. Right, I hope this book was right then. Um, Now, I'll just be honest. My understanding of being referred to as a sheep has never been a positive thing. It's normally quite derogatory. You'll say, oh, you're such a sheep. Oh, look, you're all wearing like black jeans and like black and white trainers and stuff, which is what me and Jim just seem to wear accidentally. We're not trying to be each other, we promise. Um, To me, it implies uniformity. It implies just following what everyone else is doing. And quite scarily, making no decisions on your own. But I'd recommend to you an actual adult book after the uh, game we had. And it's called The Shepherd's Life. Has anyone come across that? Written by James uh, Rebanks. And um, basically, I realised that being a shepherd is a flipping nightmare. They are a pain to herd. The phrase, it's like herding cats, I think it's unnecessary. Herding sheep is literally a full-time job. There's always a sheep who strays away from the flock. They spend the day grazing on grass and other plants. They'll walk a little further away, spotting some tasty wild flowers. They'll have their head down. They may look up and see another lovely, untouched patch of Kentucky bluegrass. And that is correct. I spent time Googling the best grass for sheep to eat for that one reference. Kentucky bluegrass. But then the sheep realises it's not in the same field. It's just over a little wall. They'll take a jump. They'll jump it. It'll be fine. Then the dark clouds start to come. They're looking up. The rain's coming down. They're looking around. And there is no one around them. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. In this book, he describes how you can hear sometimes in distant fields a piercing yet familiar whistle in the air, cutting through the rain, cutting through the wind. Here comes the shepherd calling and whistling. Sometimes, the sheep can retrace their steps and return. Sometimes the call, the whistle can be enough. Verse 29 says, What my Father has given me is greater than everything, and no one can snatch them away from the Father's care. The book goes on to describe that sometimes the sheep are paralysed with fear. They're disorientated, they don't know what's going on, and maybe they might be physically stuck. The shepherd comes alongside the sheep and will lead it back. The shepherd will even pick up the sheep and carry it if needs be. 
Verse 30 ends with, the Father and I are one. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus also is the same God we read about through our whole Bible. Quick side note, if you don't think that, it's a heresy. So I'll chat to you afterwards. But it is the same God through the, through the whole Bible who reveals himself in Jesus. I was reading a book recently called The Forgotten Father. And Jesus is so important to us because there is no father without a son. There is no calling Abba, which doesn't mean daddy, but it's a very loving, affectionate way of referring to your dad. We don't get that privilege without Jesus. I do not doubt that God created and loves everyone. I 100% believe that. I believe that when we go for walks, whether it's in our city or we go further afield and we just see beauty in creation, God created that and we can worship God for that. But for us to draw close to God the Father, God who loves us, God who wants that relationship with us, that parental relationship, that is through Jesus. We know who God is because of Jesus. What scares me is I can forget that. What scares me is that sometimes when it's good for me, I will distance myself from God a little bit. There's Jesus, my best mate, who died on the cross for me, and that's great back then. There's the Holy Spirit that will make me feel warm and fuzzy sometimes. I might get a picture, I might get a word. We'll pray for each other, we get a bit giddy. That's great as well. But then sometimes I find that I've turned God almost into a Greek God. Oh, God the Father, very scary. As he woke up on the wrong side of the bed, is he going to ruin my day? Is he going to make my day great? Basically, do I treat God the Father like Zeus? And Jesus does not give us that opportunity. His closing line is, the Father and I are one. The reason the religious people are so furious at Jesus is because when he says the Father and I are one, he is saying, I have the same power and authority as God who is in heaven. The same God you have worshipped for generations. I stood in front of you right now, have the same power and authority. And to me, I find that amazing and absolutely terrifying. There was a time when Jesus was stood on this earth stood in front of people like I am now, and he is saying, I am, which is Yahweh, which is I am now, I am God. I'm here with you, I'm bringing healing, I'm transforming lives. John Mark Homer, um, I know I shouldn't cross myself when I say his name, but it's very tempting. John Mark Homer, who um, is just a superb pastor, I think he calls himself writer, can't remember what he calls himself, all sorts of stuff. He spoke at the HTB Leadership Conference on Tuesday, and I was really sad because it was only 10 minutes, but there was one thing that he said that really struck me, and um, he just said that the reality is who you spend time with, what you spend time doing, does affect you. (laughs) And he said it, and I was like, well, obviously it does. But then you start unpacking it. I find that sometimes, when I was younger, I pretend it isn't now, Sometimes I need to be careful who I sit next to in the service. Who am I sat next to where I might feel a bit awkward raising my hands? Who are the people I speak to who will only ever say negative things about any HDB stuff? I was one of them when I first came. It was a defense mechanism. It might come as a shock to you all, but I'm not Southern. Um, (laughs) You may not have noticed my accent. I know it's so It's so great. But um, I remember the first refocus, and my gut reaction was to just kick against it. Kick against um, all these southerners telling me uh, how hard it is in the north, how God just does this, God just does that. And I realised that that is not helpful. And the danger is that I then was becoming almost like a toxic person to be around. All I do is kind of go, oh, what do they know about Liverpool? What do they know about north of the Watford Gap? Wherever it is. The fact is, God is at work everywhere. God has to be at work everywhere because that's why there's over 2 billion Christians in the world. God is transforming lives. How do you spend time with other people? 
And how do you spend time listening to Jesus? Where is his voice calling us to follow him? Not just as a church, but as individuals. What might the Spirit, if invited into our daily lives, what might the Spirit prompt us to do? Where do we find spaces to listen? Where do we grow together? Because a bit of a spoiler alert, it's not really on Sunday. You might have an experience of God, and that's great. We'll be praying with each other, and that's great. But there's, there's a lot of people in this room. It's an absolute blessing. It's wonderful. I'm used to churches averaging 14 people, um, and you know they would still sit out, really spread out, which was really annoying. But the fact is, there's loads of people here, but we need to find time as well where we gather in groups. You know, we do the small groups here as well. Spending time where we are together, and we're praying for one another, where we're building relationships. There's a cheesy line, the loneliest place can be in a crowd. But actually, I just think, when new people join us, are we welcoming them in? Do they know that they are part of this church family? The reality is, I probably don't know everybody's name in this room. You get to know mine, because it gets put up on the screen and stuff, in case you forget. But you will have really strong relationships. You can, with people around you, learning from each other. I found um, a statistic um, where they were looking at church growth. How do you measure a healthy church? And the answer was small groups. I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you kidding? What about bums on seats? No, no, no. Not bums on seats. I went to America years ago, and uh, one of the reasons um, a person I was chatting to wouldn't go to church was because of how rude they were to each other getting into and out of church in the cars. So apparently, like, they'd share a parking space, and they'd be cutting each other up, and they'd be honking the horns and shouting at each other. Then they'd come in, find their seat, worship, you know, give, have coffee, eat together, grit, back in the car, get out of the way! They're like, fight for the places to go. And he said, surely that isn't right. So numbers aren't everything. It is about how are we together. I encourage you, if you're not in a small group, get in one. And then the other one is, uh, I know Jim spoke about this last week, is what if we took courage and acted on Jesus' commands, not just in this verse, but this idea of praying for each other, This idea of truly believing Jesus is alive and at work now. Jesus does want to bring healing, prayer for the sick, liberation, freedom for people who might feel bound by labels, by things in their lives that they think they are just trapped by. Just to make you aware that we've got this prayer ministry training. It's going to be, do we have a slide for that? Oh, we do. Look at this as well. We've got these QR codes so you can take a picture. If you take a picture of that, it will come up on your phone. It blew my mind, but um, that's fine. May the 17th and May the 24th, both on Tuesdays, it's going to be this prayer ministry training. And this is an opportunity as well, not to learn how to pray, but to encourage and build each other up in having courage to pray to be involved in people's lives. As you know that, we've got these seven weeks up to Pentecost, and we have these seven focuses. Can we have the slide up? Uh, That's not the one I was expecting, but it's fine. Well, we're praying for, there's the seven, there's the 70. There's inviting 70 people to Alpha. There's having 70 people return to church. There's getting the 70 care to keep the church doing the ministry we already do. And we need to be praying for that together. We need to be doing that all together, not just a solo mission. Again, this isn't another giving vision Sunday thing. But we're talking about the Holy Spirit speaking to us about what do we give? How do we serve our community? I don't want to go all high church on you, but um, there's a great line. If you go to a traditional uh, Church of England service, when the bread and wine is walked down, the, which is the offertory, if you ever get it in a quiz, the bread and wine's coming down. And then the giving's brought down as well, the money. And we say a prayer over the money. We say a prayer over the bread and wine. And the line I absolutely love, it's almost like a bucket of cold water on my head is this. We say, all things come from you 
and of your own do we give you. All things come from you, God, already, so we just give back to you. Everything is God's, and we acknowledge that by giving back, we know it is from God. You see, it's really funny. Um, my dad plays in a band, and I get to play with him quite a lot, and it's great fun, R&B stuff, Dr. Feelgood. If you're into that, we're playing in Staxtonbury soon. Um, anyway, it's a tiny little farm. But we do a song by the Rolling Stones, and... Um, and, and it talks about sending money in to uh, basically an, a TV evangelist. If you send money in, we'll pray for you, you'll be healed. And I got into a really interesting conversation with one of the previous guitarists who said, that's the problem with church, that's all you do. You lure people in, you make them feel welcome, and then you ask them for money. And I was like, well, how do you think stuff happens how do you think it works? How do you think we pay for the electricity? Like it doesn't just come out of thin air. And then I realised that he'd gone to a church where it had an amazing experience of Jesus. I was like, that's amazing. He said, but what put me off is I feel like all they want is your money. And I just want to say that isn't the case here. If you've got 70k kicking about, absolutely. But what struck me, for those of you who do the Bible in one year or started it or whatever, is that it's back to those words in the liturgy, which is why we give. We don't give so we can feel smug about it. We don't give because we feel guilty about it. We give because we know all things come from God and we give back. You see, it'd be interesting to see, uh, I was just thinking about this, when we come to Harvest Festival and people bring in an out-of-date tin of beans, or they bring in like some mouldy bread. Because we've removed it, haven't we? We've said, oh, well, it's not about money. It's about bringing food in. But originally, that is what would have been the currency. It would have been bartering. It would have been trading a fish for bread. And giving always has been, just for the record, giving always has been an act of worship. Whether it's going to St. Swithin's, whether it's going to the cathedral, whether it's going to Alive, whether it's going to any other church, the act of giving is worship. The first fruit, the first crop, whatever it may be. Because we remember all things come from you and of your own do we give you. So to end, put the red letters into practice, what Jesus has been saying, hearing his voice. It's not just about hearing it on a Sunday. It's not just about the internal me and God, but it's us and God. It's us as a community. You see, if Jesus is healing and bringing wholeness, if Jesus is still alive, then all the other stuff is still happening. Jesus is still calling us by name, Jesus is still directing our church. And we are still Jesus' body. And I just think, let's join in. Let's take that bravery, that knowing that we are with Jesus and Jesus is with us. Let's take that out with us. As I said earlier when I was sharing about the stories of courage, it's inviting. That's it. That's where it stops. If you think God literally is just sat on a throne and we're kind of scurrying around trying to get people to go and talk to him. You've got the wrong idea. Jesus is already out there. Jesus is already at work. And we are joining in. Our courage is the invite. Once we invite, it's between them and God. I'm very excited about it. Totally lost track of time. Really sorry. Let's stand. <laughs>